Hi and welcome to Russians with Attitude. I and Kirill have invited a classically trained historian who specializes in medieval history, Hans Unicht. Hi, Hans. Hello, hello. Uh, great honor to be here, of course. Thank you. In our podcast on Galkovsky, a phantom Rome hypothesis, I jokingly asked for a medieval scholar to show up, and here you are. So how did you like this uh, episode and Dmitry Galkovsky's theory? I thought it was uh, it was really fantastic. I I, uh, I know, of course, uh, Harry Bat Illy's phantom time hypothesis, uh, and also Fomenko a little bit, and I found both of those sort of you know conspiratorial attempts to alter the chronology of of the classical and medieval periods. I found them uh, less convincing, but Galkovsky, I thought he has sort of a coherent historical philosophy, right? Uh, sort of an evidentiary standard he sets that print is necessary that allows him sort of to effectively, if not delete, at least to mute a lot of centuries at once. And it's it's defensible, right? It's a defensible idea. What is the general approach to this uh, kind of uh, conspiracies in academia? They're totally ignored, right? Um, the I, I know a little bit about Harry Bat Illy. Uh, because of some of my work, I, I came into contact with him and his disciples as a graduate student. And later they liked my dissertation. And I uh, and there is there's a little bit of polemicizing by professional historians against people like Illy. Uh, but their ideas, nobody reads him, of course, they're just completely ignored. Okay, so what are the main ideas and uh, concepts that can prove uh, this skepticism with regards to the medieval period? Well, why is the medieval period strange? Yes, yes. Oh, it's well, it's it's a combination of things, right? Uh, I think on your Galkovsky episode, you said that uh, the medieval period has an odd fairy tale feel about it, right? That it's the, the setting and the locus for for uh, uh, fantasies and myths. Uh, that's obviously there's something that seems a little bit unreal about the medieval period. Unlike the classical period, there are or, or the, the modern period, there are enormous problems with evidence, right? I think you also mentioned there aren't the material culture from the medieval period, especially the early medieval centuries. So after the fifth to the seventh, eighth century, well, even later, there's very little material culture survives at all. If you look at the archeological work, they, they find a few stones in a ditch or some wood or something is very materially poor. And the obviously the way manuscripts transmission functions it's very alien if you're used to print right the texts don't have a fixed form they're not known universally things are interpolated and forged all the time uh, so the from many different perspectives the medieval period is is kind of unique uh, in, in I guess at least Western history right yeah um, I think uh, what's so interesting about Gokovsky and his approach uh, as opposed to people like I don't know Velikovsky or um, Ilik, or Fomenko is that he tries to avoid conjecture whenever possible, right? So it's more of a, it's not a, I think it's less of a historical approach, it's more of a theory of science approach. It's a theory of the science of history, right? Uh, so what can we know? It's a question of historiography and how we have to talk about. And uh, of course, uh, skepticism towards sources is also, uh, I think you're, probably familiar with that because of your work that sources are not uh, to be well it's possible the sources can be falsified even if they're authentic from the time period they don't necessarily have to be trusted many people know about this just if we talk about i don't know maybe military chronicles right when you have descriptions of battles with like a uh, hundred thousand uh, on both sides which is absurd because the economies couldn't have sustained that uh, it's just mechanically impossible and we know that this means that the sources are lying but uh, in academia i mean i'm a trained historian myself i'm not much uh, engaged in academic circles nowadays but um, what always strikes me is that people are they choose and pick which parts of the sources to trust and which not to trust and it's always um, seems like it's a matter of comfort like, if uh, the source uh, supports your theory, you think it's authentic. And if it, if it doesn't, uh, it's not. What I found especially interesting about the early medieval period 
is that for the last decade, I don't know, maybe half century even, um, more or less the mainstream in, in academia has become that the fall of Rome wasn't as bad as um, people thought, right? Yes, that yes, uh, yes. that it's not, it was in the Dark Ages, there was no collapse, people living through the fall of the Roman Empire didn't even notice that it fell and so on. But then I read a book that uh, I don't remember when it came out, The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization by Ward Perkins. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's it. an excellent book. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's really hammers down the point that there was a collapse and it was an apocalyptic collapse. Um, you had like, uh, I don't know, a thousand things like the pottery was worse, uh, the cows were half as big and so on, uh, the urbanization on an unprecedented scale. and. What this means is that uh, what historians of the early medieval period have been writing for decades is just wrong. It is just yes. completely wrong. No question. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's very odd what happened. I think it was a sort of a post-World War II movement to reinterpret the, the end of the Western Roman Empire along uh, the lines of sort of nonviolent cultural transfers, ethnogenesis. I, I don't know what, you know, they invented a lot of, a lot of sort of, Uh, uh, ways of explaining away the collapse of the Western Roman Empire that made it feel nonviolent and friendly. Uh, and, and those primarily American historians, I even studied under some of the leading guys that, that helped direct this narrative. They're all retired now, many are dead. And it was always transparently false. It was not true, right? Uh, there is no way uh, contemporary sources all said that, you know, this is, this is a catastrophe. The archaeological sources which we had for a long time you know what ward perkins writes about that was always known uh, the west becomes materially poorer after the fifth sixth century it becomes depopulated the roads go away uh yeah it was it was a very serious moment and historians just by privileging certain sources or others or or trivializing or qualifying certain texts can completely alter uh the the perception of of the field for sure yeah um What I personally found interesting is the thing I stumbled upon um, on my own research on unrelated things is that when um, it was the chronicle of um, Leo Prant of Cremona, I don't know if you're... Yeah, of course. Yeah, familiar, I know. Yes, um, yes, very much. Who was sent to Constantinople by Berengar II. And what really uh, striking I found is that uh, he recorded uh, about the cuisine of Byzantium, <laughs> that they ate everything with some kind of disgusting fish sauce, uh, yes. which he could, couldn't place, which he, he didn't understand what it was and why the Byzantines slaughtered everything they ate in this fish sauce. And obviously this was just garum and uh, an yes. absolute staple in ancient Rome, an absolute staple. They ate it with everything like mayonnaise or ketchup or ranch dressing nowadays. And yes. I, I think it uh, really is, shows that how the cultural continuity was broken so badly in the remnants of the Western Roman Empire that even everyday food was completely forgotten, which was obviously a result of disrupted trade routes and so on, but uh, just that people didn't even remember it. Yes, and, and garum is made, obviously, from fish and fish oils, I believe. And uh, I think one of the things that happens in Uh, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire is that most people can't sail very effectively anymore. And fishing is something that just isn't done very often. And perhaps that's why it disappears. But it's very striking, Liutprand of Cremona, not knowing about this basic sort of universal Mediterranean condiment uh, that is still, of course, used in the East. Uh, he is Italian, right? It's very remarkable. Mm -hmm. That was also a very popular theory for uh, many years. Um, that the disruption of the trade routes was the main thing. Uh, I think it's uh, the Piran hypothesis. About, yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Mahomet yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. About the Arabs disrupting trade routes and this led to the economic downfall of, uh, of Western Europe. But uh, as I said, the, the Ward Perkins book uh, conclusively shows, in my opinion, that uh, this collapse happened centuries before the Arab yes, conquest. Yes, yes. Yes, so the whole problem, yeah, exactly. The whole problem with Piren's thesis is he's very much along the lines of the post-war Americans, maybe even in, anticipated them, uh, inspired them in some ways, that he, he wants to say that the fall of the Western Roman Empire wasn't a problem, right? That he just moves everything later. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's kind of a general trend in history, you know, um, downplaying the role of violence. Um, even if you go, like, uh, outside the 
the topic uh, we are most familiar with, like the medieval or classical period, uh, prehistorical stuff. Uh, some people were always saying that um, the migrations of the prehistoric period were extremely violent and genocidal. And you had many mainstream historians saying that this wasn't the case, that it was like cultural exchange and people mixed and assimilated. And then the DNA study about Spain came out <laughs> and, and it showed that basically the whole male population of Iberia was exterminated and the conquerors just took the... Uh, so there was only uh, why mitochondrial DNA there. Yes, only the no, women, no, right? Yeah. The, 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 uh, the men were all completely wiped out. Yes. It's probably uh, ideological to show that uh, like it is, I think it's pretty stupid actually it, 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 oh, it's, 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 it's not even very smart it's just very primitive ideological point scoring um, to, to look at I don't know stuff that people nowadays talk about I don't know mass migration and so on and just uh, try to show that it has never been a problem in history Yes, absolutely. There's a, it's a completely ideologically motivated. I, the the effort to sort of defang the past and make the movements of populations peaceful and happy is is is, is absolutely a sort of sort of this liberal uh, ideological project, right? And uh, the the you can see this at all levels of of historical analysis and archaeologists who repeatedly deny that invasions were violent. I just read a paper, some lunatic Anglo-Saxonist saying that the, the, the Viking invasions in Anglo-Saxon England were primarily civilian events and they were just, you know, tourists or something. Mm -hmm. uh, this stuff is, it's pervasive and completely retarded, right? This is, yeah, I don't know what to say about it. It's just dumb. So what is the point of uh, making history to appear less bloody and less savage? What's uh, the interest of the mainstream historians in doing this? Well, I think this, I, I can only speculate, you know, I avoid most of these people, but <laughs> but on the one hand, they, they are very effete people and increasingly medieval and even increasingly ancient history is done by majority female professors and researchers. Uh, the men involved are very effete and unfit and they have no experience. They've never served in the army. They have no experience of athleticism or, or military uh, endeavors. They have no idea or interest in these things. They're very passive people personally, just interpersonally, if you know them. And they also support leftist, you know, mass immigration political programs. And they don't want to sort of litter history with examples of, uh, you know, the mass movements of peoples being, you know, genocidal or destructive, which they always are. Oh, right? I they, see, right? I see. So let's define terms a bit. Uh, what is a conspiracy? What difference does a conspiracy have uh, with uh, an alternative theory? Right. That's so. So a conspiracy, if if I understand Illich and Fomenko, some of the others correctly, uh, the the conspiracy suggests that some of the past has been invented via sort of the secret arrangements or the strategizing or a pro secret project of forgery arranged by specific people, right? So Illich believes, I think, that the Ottonians under Otto III forged a bunch of manuscripts and documents to sort of, you know, add some prior centuries, and that that was done between the Pope and the, the, the Holy Roman Emperor as part of sort of a hidden project with hidden aims, right? So it was conspiratorial in that way. Uh, I think Fomenko also has ideas about in the early modern period uh, how the chronology was built by by various actors, the papacy, others, uh, for certain reasons. So that you know, there's this idea of hidden knowledge or hidden arrangements behind the scenes uh, manipulating our view of things, right? So that would be a conspiracy. An alternative theory would obviously anything else uh, doesn't require any any uh, malicious hidden coordinated action. But it could. So I guess conspiracy falls under the broader umbrella, right, of alternative theories. There's others, too. Were you familiar with uh, Dmitry Galkovsky and his theories before our podcast, or did you just learn through this episode? I, I heard I, I have a few Russian friends but uh, who had mentioned him to me, but I, I, I had never, of course, been able to read him. I can't read Russian. And I didn't know he he had proposed these sort of alternative historical theories. I, he was just a name I sort of knew. Uh, so yes, this was very fascinating to, to learn about. Yeah. What is actually the role of conjecture and speculation when writing history? Oh, it's well, it's I think first of all, conspiratorial thinking, imagining who has what motives uh, and why, uh, what 
could possibly be intentional, uh, what is an accident, what kinds of strategies might be at work to explain events, thinking in these, in these, in these ways flexibly and conspiratorially about actors and, and how the things you're reading might be forged or might have been arranged or, or the events you are reading about in Chronicles might have been staged uh, is, is always necessary and, and interesting and, and it's also fun, right? And, and I think that that kind of mental flexibility is, is, is central to, to being a historian. And, and, you know, most historians are extremely conventional and aren't interested in that kind of work. But I find sort of the role of supposition and conspiratorial thinking useful in all contexts, right? In political, contemporary uh, contexts, and also in the past as, as a way of, of both inquiring into what other narratives the sources will support, not just the standard one that you've received, and, and also learning to think flexibly about uh, the evidence and the historical actors you, you study, right? Uh, so even if you don't find all conspiracy theories necessarily convincing, it's very interesting to read about them. I find it intriguing. And and uh, it's also, I just think, you know, uh, good mental hygiene to, to always be considering these questions, right? Yeah, I agree. It's uh, <clears throat> very important to have a kind of viewpoint that is completely different and outside the mainstream and not influenced by general trends. In general, I think that a lot of the, the historical narrative, especially in the pre-modern period where nothing is printed, there are manuscripts, uh, these historical narratives are developed over time, usually in the mid to late 19th century, and then they're just sort of fixed, right? And you get handed these things and all the other evidence, all the coins and the documents, everything gets just sort of fit into it. And it's, it's uh, sort of trying to question the sort of fundamental narrative that's been handed to you can be very difficult. And frequently, it doesn't seem to be right. You know, uh, the things that are sort of taught traditionally in history courses about everything from, I don't know, the migration period to the Crusades, uh, they're full of problems and things that don't necessarily make sense. Right. And and but you're given these narratives. Uh, they are just true. And it could be remarkably difficult because of things like the anchoring bias to upset them. Right. So, Hans, please tell us uh, about your favorite conspiracy theory. Oh, a, a historical one. Historical. Yes. Oh, that's uh, preferably okay, I, that happened in Middle Ages. It happened in the Middle Ages. The obvious, the obvious one that any medievalist would tell would be the 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 story of Pope Joan, right? That there was accidentally mm -hmm. a, they accidentally uh, consecrated a female pope, Pope Joan, and uh, and that this was subsequently covered up by by the Curia and the papacy because it was a scandal and an accident. Uh, this conspiracy is used to explain a number of things. Like uh, there is some some sort of uh, latrine chair uh, that's in. The, I, I don't know too much about this. It's it's uh, it's it's in the ruins somewhere around the Lateran or was unearthed uh, in the Middle Ages. This was known and and it has you know it's, it's a toilet basically and it has a hole in it. And the myth is that because it was near the ladder and this is where the Pope would always sit, so they could tell that if he had testicles or not, right? Uh, so that the Pope Joan thing would never happen again. So that's that's like one very standard, boring uh, medieval conspiracy theory. I don't, I don't. There aren't really very many uh, such stories, right? The the big phantom time hypothesis, the chronological conspirators are are the big names, but medieval history is very. I don't know. It's 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 very it's it's a uh, it's a very conservative field. It doesn't have a lot of. It, it's very inaccessible to outsiders. Things are you know in manuscripts hard to read. The languages are hidden. So. So it's it's sort of it doesn't have as much popular speculation or or insight as other fields, right? It's not like the modern period. How did you like uh, Galkowski's uh, theory about the origins of uh, Christianity? I thought it was fantastic. It's very intriguing. I don't I don't know too much about the the early Christian period, uh, but the the idea that the, there's obviously something a little bit off about the earliest Christians, the martyr cult, is, I think is very strange. Uh, not not adequately explained. Thought the idea that they are some sort of undertakers association uh, is is fascinating uh, and very intriguing. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually I um, Golkovsky himself never mentioned this, and I'm I'm not sure he knows. Uh, but I completely accidentally stumbled upon this. Um, there are a number of uh, Roman sources from the first century that make sense of the Christians as a burial society. I mean, as you I mean, you might know that burial societies were quite important yes. in the Roman Empire. There were kind of, um, I'm just explaining this for our listeners, uh, Roman burial societies were kind of like clubs or associations, often having religious or political or social significance. 
and they were just a way of uh, social organization on low levels in the Roman Empire. So people uh, would, uh, well, it was basically just pooling resources together to pay for each other's funerals. And uh, of course, they became political actors um, from this. And uh, there are a number of uh, Roman sources that refer to the Christians as a specific kind of burial society and not an organized religion. I found this quite interesting. No, it's very it's very intriguing, and and the you know the, there is the the early Christian early Christianity is almost a different religion from what happens after after Constantine makes the church an official entity, right? Then it, it's it's all sort of reinvented and reconstructed into a sort of quasi state religion, or then an explicitly state religion somewhat later. Uh, the earliest the earliest centuries of Christianity and how exactly uh, they they came to achieve such prominence and in which social sectors is is something that that yeah hasn't I don't, I don't know I, I think it's it's something that the sources provide very intermittent not always reliable information about and that also modern historians or you know historians today haven't 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 done a very good good job of, of excavating so no I find this very convincing yeah or at least intriguing yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely so let's uh, move on a bit a bit uh, maybe to the field where you have the most expertise um forgeries um yes what i uh i've been thinking about before we started recording this show is um the relationship between the abundance of forgeries and manuscript culture so basically uh which uh, so is manuscript culture or printing culture more susceptible to uh convincing forgeries this very so I haven't done any empirical work to try to figure out you know if they there are obviously of course many print forgeries as well people just claim that they're printing an ancient text mm -hmm. or something, uh, but the obviously the, there is the pervasive uncertainty the intellectual uncertainty in manuscript culture would seem to make forging in a world of of, of only handwritten texts uh, much much easier and more enticing right the. Uh, because texts don't have a fixed form, they're not universally known, they're rare, they don't circulate very easily. Uh, you can always rely on other people's ignorance or naivete about the proper form of the document or whatever to mm -hmm. to alter things. Uh, so I, I would say definitely the op it seems like it would be easier in a manuscript uh, culture to, to alter documents, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, which are the most famous medieval forgeries? I mean, I mean probably the donation of... Constantine comes to mind uh, as uh, one of the most important ones. Yeah, I think th it's sort of the archetypal one, right? This this idea that 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 uh, Constantine gave uh, gave Pope Sylvester the Western Roman Empire uh, the that was only uncovered in the Renaissance. That's the the main one. There are, of course, the, the most in in a way the critical study of medieval history was was invented in the early modern period by a bunch of bunch of Benedictine uh, monks in France and Belgium who realized that the possessions of their monasteries were ultimately documented and proven by a bunch of you know, medieval charters and that many of these weren't, weren't authentic. And they developed sort of the formal study of, of documents, you know, diplomatics is what the field is called, uh, studying the formal features of charters to try to understand you, these are deeds, you know, Kings or bishops issue monasteries uh, the right over a certain piece of land or the right to be immune from royal justice or something. These documents are often forged, and it was this was in many ways the foundations of modern sort of critical approaches to to medieval history, especially ecclesiastical history. And these these charters are pervasively forged uh, all throughout the medieval period. It's a huge problem, and uh, they they are one of our major sort of non-narrative sources for what's happening. So they don't necessarily tell a story, but they attest that, you know, this institution exists here, or this guy's abbot or bishop or whoever. And these are routinely forged and it's a huge, it's a huge subfield of, of medieval history. So you can go through like a whole list of famous charter forgeries. There are obviously uh, literary forgeries as well, are very pervasive people pretending to be a church father, people pretending to be uh all manner of personalities, right? Any 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 famous person uh, or prominent person will have things forged in his name. Uh, yeah, so so th there are it, it's a pervasive issue with medieval sources for sure. Uh, that's actually really interesting. Um, I didn't know about uh, the monks um, in coming up with the, this way of 
well, let's call it literary criticism. <laughs> yeah, for sure, absolutely, yes. Um, I thought that this was a renaissance thing that basically began when people uh, started criticizing the Corpus Hermeticum, Kosovoan and so on, when they uh, basically proved that the Corpus Hermeticum wasn't as old as people claimed. I didn't know that it was even, uh, like, as you said, a couple centuries earlier. Could you? T uh, in this place, a couple centuries later. I mean, obviously there are many different, mm -hmm. different, the different ways that the critical study begins. But the, the yes, the Renaissance is is, is sort of a key era. Uh, the beginning of you know Lorenzo Valla also discovers the donation of Constantine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's it's sort of the beginning of. But the Renaissance scholars uh, they're mainly interested in finding out what isn't classical and excluding it, right? Uh, uh, so so they're not the the first time you have sort of a critical study of of say charters and documents produced in the medieval period is really in the early modern era. So the 17th, mm -hmm. 18th century, uh, uh, they begin to in critically investigate the, the traditions of their own institutions, these monks, uh, by investigating the proper forms of the charters that give them rights to land and give them rights, freedom from royal authority and so forth. And uh, that's really where a lot of a lot of my field first came to be, you know, uh, The, so it's unlike the Renaissance period, which is mainly about trying to exclude the you know, the, the medieval accretions and the spurious stuff uh, from the medieval period. They're actually interested in, in the medieval tradition, at least what is authentic in it, right? Yeah, that's really interesting. But harking back to the questioner ask, so what, what are some examples of forgeries that were like very important or influential or had uh, many real life consequences uh, aside from like not small local stuff, but maybe a bit larger scale? Probably one of the most, one of the, the sort of the most audacious and famous uh, forgeries of the medieval period would be the pseudo Isidorian forgeries, mm -hmm. and this is in its this is this is a huge historical problem that's in many ways not solved. But unknown people in the middle of the ninth century forged a huge series of laws, uh, basically papal letters. Papal popes would write rescripts to clarify points of law, and they interpolated a bunch of. Uh, Conciliar documents, so the legislation of church councils. Uh, this is the, the volume of material is enormous. Maybe it's 800,000 words or something. You know, it's enormous amount of material that these people forged, uh, and the purposes aren't totally clear. Uh, but the pseudo Isidorian forgeries, which, I, by the way, one one of the the donation of Constantine is a part of this complex. It looks like pseudo Isidore found it somewhere. He didn't invent it, but he he. The reason that we even know about the donation of Constantine is because pseudo Isidore picked it up. Uh, the, the purpose of these forgeries was to, we think, to uh, basically protect the rights of, of, I would say, rank and file bishops in the Carolingian kingdoms from sort of secular interference or the interference of archbishops and higher ups in the, in the hierarchy. Uh, and uh, bizarrely, this was one of the major strategies the pseudo Isidore uses to protect bishops is he he sort of wants to open an, an a path of appeal if they're accused of crimes. He wants to open the possibility of appeals to the Pope in Rome. And so Pseudo Isidore, uh, by constructing this entire fictional legal world, uh, ends up sort of by accident contributing enormously to to the sort of legal prominence of the papacy in the longer run. Right. So that's one of the one of the, the most historically significant forgeries. It's a huge problem, Pseudo Isidore. Uh, there are, there are, uh, of course, you can just the the uh, the Merovingian kings. Uh, there's only about 30, 30 of their documents, their charters issuing land or rights or something, uh, survive in the original and papyrus. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of manuscript copies, or what claim to be manuscript copies of Merovingian charters. These are the, the dynasty that predates the Carolingians, right? So they're the kings in Gaul between the the sixth to the basically the eighth century uh so it's a lot of time uh in sort of modern day france all of their documents that don't survive in the original are forged they were forged by you know monasteries or different institutions autonomously as a means of trying to locate their rights in, in ancient kings uh that's very it's very intriguing that uh that if it doesn't survive in the original for the merovingians uh it's not real uh the um A good part of the Merovingian charters, uh, that 30 something that survived in the original, they only survived because they were the in the in the early Middle Ages. Uh, these kings, the Merovingian kings, still issued uh, documents uh, 
the deeds and and rights and so forth. They still issued these charters on papyrus. They're sort of a holdover from the Roman period. They, they must have had a hookup with the the Arabs in North Africa, and uh, they so they would still order the papyrus and issue as as authorities in the Roman era would have done on. They issued their documents on these big papyrus scrolls, and uh, the problem for later later rulers like in the 12th century or later forgers in the 12th century was to forge a, a Merovingian charter in the original, there wasn't any papyrus anymore, right? And they had to, uh, so a lot of the Merovingian charters that survive only survive because they were turned over and forgeries were copied onto the back uh, so that they would look old. And they were then glued like like the, the actual original charter uh, that they were repurposing was then glued down to a board so that so that no one could see it. And this was discovered in the early modern period, like librarians in, in the Archive uh, in Paris were like trying to like like unpeel them from the boards to discover the original documents under these very obvious forgeries, right? But these were these were accepted as authentic documents for centuries and centuries. They were almost all done. I think every everyone forged in this way was done by the the Royal Monastery of Saint Denis uh, outside Paris. That's that's a very famous sort of forgery mm -hmm. operation. Yeah. Well, it seems like forgeries were pretty routine in the medieval period, actually. Like for basically anything you could think up, they they just uh, it's a very convenient way. So, um, did people just accept this? The, uh, so, what was the? I mean, was it widely known in the medieval period that people forged these things, or was it just that people didn't even conceive of it? It, so, so it was. It, it's a very interesting question. It's it's very hard to. There are sporadic complaints about forged documents or forged texts or interpolated texts. They do exist. Uh, there's this idea related to the idea this, this t attempt to sort of remove violence from the past. There's another idea, you know, that they just thought differently from us, and these weren't really attempts to deceive anybody. They just have a different epistemology. Uh, what should be true was true for them. This is all nonsense, obviously. It was deplored, but they didn't have very good means of detecting forged text. That's, that's, on, uh, that's one reason. I think also a, a certain number of these forgeries are done uh, via prior arrangement with the the uh, with the authorities, right? So, 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 so like a lot of papal letters and, and privileges are forged Uh, but then they're confirmed by popes who ought to know better because they contain such enormous formal irregularities. You'd think anyone in the papal chancery would look at this this completely fake document and and immediately throw it out. Uh, and, and, and they rarely do. And so one imagines, at least I would imagine, that in these cases, they uh, there's a prior understanding, right? The, the, the pope wants to sort of confer privileges to a certain monastery and portray these privileges as a long-standing tradition or, you know, long-standing uh, uh, privilege the monasteries enjoyed. And so they sort of come up with this, right? And, and the Pope rubber stamps it. I think that's that's often a scenario, but there are cases where they get caught. So the, the, the abbot of Fulda, this is something I've thought a lot about, uh, who's this really stupid guy, Rabanus Morris is his name. Uh, and this is, in, again, in the ninth century. I know more about a lot of this. Uh, and he, uh, Rabanus Morris is, is Abbot of Fulda, and he's trying to get the privileges of his of his monastery confirmed by the Pope. And he, so he sends a bunch of messengers to Rome with uh, in the ancient charters of his of his abbey, and the Pope is supposed to confirm them. And instead, the Pope locks locks them all up and uh, and declares that all these documents are crap. <laughs> and uh, and 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 it looks like Rabanus Morris is just a total idiot and had no idea that these were forgeries. They had probably been forged by his predecessor as Abbot, and he just had no clue. And he thought that they were authentic, and he was trying to get them confirmed. And uh, instead, his messengers spent like several years in some sort of cellar in in in, <laughs> in the Vatican. It's pretty funny. Uh, the uh, so there's that. There's there's um, I'm going to mess up the details of some of this, but there is a uh, the Bishop of Rouen in the 12th century. I, I knew the man who who was editing his his letters and his papers, and one of them is is a remarkable letter about. This this monk whose name is Guerno and, and about his deathbed confession and he was a master forger, and he and, and he, he says on his deathbed he's he's asking you know for forgiveness that he's forged a bunch of charters for and he names a bunch of abbeys uh, Saint Augustine's Canterbury was one of them and other 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 prominent abbeys and he was consulted obviously to forge these these documents in in a crucial period where monasteries are trying to get uh, independence from their diocesan bishops and so uh, as part of a sort of a church reform initiative that's happening 
And so, so this is a huge wave of forgery. Everyone wants these privileges. And so Guerno is obviously the guy that was sent all over Europe to, to draw up these documents. And, and, and the Bishop of Rouen, and this is mentioned in this letter, he's writing to his colleagues and they're all discussing, you know, what do we do about this? Or did he forge anything for us? <laughs> <laughs> is this ever going to come to light? You know, the, so obviously forgeries are, are sometimes found, uh, but not as often as you would think, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so were there any mechanisms to protect against forgery or to verify documents? Because um, I know that in at least in the Eastern Roman Empire, at least for imperial degrees, they had a rather simple system. They had a special ink that was used only for imperial degrees. And possessing this ink or trying to make something that looked like that was punishable by death. And yes. so uh, was there something like this in the West? Yes, there. Well, there obviously it's the West is much more decentralized, right? So you have different chanceries, the 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 people who issue the documents. So so you know the French king or the Carolingians will have their own chanceries issuing these things. Uh, the Pope will have the papal chancery, and yes, these chanceries, uh, when the original documents survive, and it's generally the case from the eighth ninth century onwards, uh, it's it's. Uh, they all have various security features, uh, and the study of them is, is again part of the whole subfield. But they they, they cultivate special scripts uh, that aren't easy to for ordinary people to write. So they're difficult to read, and uh, they're obviously chancery personnel are trained in these scripts. So not everyone can write them very easily. You know, I, I mentioned Saint Denis uh, forging a bunch of Merovingian charters on papyrus. The Merovingian chancery on their original documents sort of has a late Roman cursive script that they've developed that is almost completely illegible. It's, it looks insane. And it's obviously done uh, to uh, to make these documents very difficult to forge. And you see the 12th century monks at Saint-Denis trying to forge uh, these sort of simulacra of Merovingian charters have a huge problem trying to imitate the script, right? So the scripts themselves are, are one method. Uh, the early medieval charters of, uh, the of papal charters have all kinds of Features, uh, there are specific chancery personnel who leave initials or certain signs. We don't understand all of them at certain corners of the document or the parchment is folded a certain way and there's signs behind it. Uh, the, these are obviously indications of certain personnel who were there who can attest to its authenticity. Uh, we don't understand, again, don't understand all of them. Uh, there are, of course, special seals that are used, so wax seals that are impressed with a matrix, which in the Middle Ages, I gather, is not very easy to to develop, right, uh, an, a, an iron matrix or whatever they're made out of, lead or something. Uh, it's, it's not so easy. Uh, there are the, the, the Merovingians and Carolingian charters, their chanceries uh, include authenticating statements in uh, this, this sort of, I, almost I would say a cipher, the, it's called the, the, the Tyronian note shorthand system. It's known from late antiquity. It's an extremely difficult uh, and opaque uh, sort of, encoding method that nobody nobody outside of a few trained personnel can read and we actually couldn't read it ourselves until the 19th century and they 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 use this to like give the date the document was issued on there'll be a little tyronian uh, a little sequence of tyronian notes like in the bottom corner uh it's obviously another authenticating method uh but what's bizarre is that there are plenty of forged carolingian charters for example that don't have any of these features or that or that they try to write tyronian notes but they fail and they don't make any sense or something right and and, and it just looked completely crazy and and uh and no one no one no one cares right they they still get authenticated and it's still it's still everyone's fine with this uh so yeah, on the one hand, there are these methods to to avert forgery, but then we have very obvious forgeries that survive and and uh, n don't really seem to have been used as you would expect. That's really interesting. Yeah, I uh, must admit I didn't know most of what you just said. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really very interesting. Um, another point that uh, I started noticing after reading Golkovsky, I had never thought about this before, is that uh, criticism of sources uh, with regards to when these sources were discovered. Like if you have a source yes. uh, that is supposed to be from the 10th century or something, and but it gets discovered only in the 19th century, then it's, it's almost, a, Kalkowski says, uh, almost a 100% chance that it's a forgery. Um, w I extremely heavily noticed this when uh, looking at Russian medieval history. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the tale of yes. Igor's campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, yes. Uh, which uh, supposedly um, 12th or 13th century source, which was discovered in 1795, so all, like 600 years later. 
and um, it see it, it, this is just um, well most scholars believe it to be authentic, but it just seems so ridiculous to me, um, especially because um, another point is that you know the guy who discovered the birch bark manuscripts in Novgorod. Um, Architsovsky, I think was his name. Um, he was also one of the Soviet historians who was like um, foremost in analyzing the tale of Igor's campaign. And he basically came to the conclusion that it's absolutely correct and true. But if you look at this method, it's absolutely insane. So they constructed uh, like a dictionary or lexicon of medieval Russian grammar and so on on the basis of the tale of Igor's campaign. And then they analyzed the book according to the rules they derived from this work to to uh, come to the conclusion that it's authentic. It is just circular reasoning. It makes no sense at all. And there is a bunch of these uh, sources, um, not just in Russia, um, that were discovered like in the early Romantic period. And uh, it's also, I think, very obvious to me um, if you think about it in an unbiased way that these things uh, are also just ideological forgeries to support the romantic nationalist narratives of the time. No, it's very interesting. Uh, the I would also say there's a, an additional wrinkle. So it's as true, uh, especially historical narrative sources have a way of not really being used or or known until you know the 19th century or so, right? This is also true for not all, but for many for many Western uh, Western narrative sources as well. So central texts aren't aren't really cultivated or known. Um, huge monuments of literary monuments, like you know the manuscript that contains Beowulf, I believe, wasn't known until the 19th century. It's it's very strange, and uh, part of it, I think, is that the 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 I guess the innocent explanation would be that uh, the only portion of the tradition that is continuously cultivated from the medieval period until the early modern era. So that gets you across the printing gap is, is uh, the devotional texts, right? The biblical texts and the commentaries and the liturgical stuff. And, and so that's the only thing that everyone's paying attention to. And then, and then the historians then have to find the forgotten narrative sources. Uh, but that, even if you, even if that's, that's convincing to you uh, in, for the more Western uh, side of history, even if that convinces you, it should still should give you grave misgivings about the accuracy of these sources, uh, especially given 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 that you know there's we don't have for many of them the contemporary context or how they were received or whether anyone thought they were correct or anything like that. Uh, an additional angle for for that is definitely true also for for the early uh, the old Slavonic texts, but that is also enormous even for the classical tradition is that the manuscript traditions themselves of, of old texts are often very young, right? Uh, so most classical literature, like classical Latin literature, doesn't doesn't survive in manuscripts older than the ninth century. There's a big script reform then. And uh, so, you know, the major authors, Tacitus, Caesar, all of them, um, almost all of them don't survive in earlier manuscripts at all. Uh, the the for Greek, it's even worse, right? A lot of those are like I think the earliest manuscript of the Iliad is in 11th century, 10th century. Uh, it's it's very it's it's there's a huge there's a huge historical gulf here, right? Yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, and and, and, it's and, very and odd. I think the manuscripts of the classical authors are a very interesting topic in themselves, um, like how they uh, actually ended up in the West. There, is, there are a couple of competing theories, like there is like the most mainstream one that the uh, most popular one is that the Arabs saved them. Um, and introduce them to, through Spain into Europe. And uh, a minority position is that basically the Eastern Romans uh, ne never lost those texts and they always had them and they just got introduced uh, like partly after the fall of uh, Constantinople, partly before that by scholars. And uh, it's all quite interesting. Um, is there anything in your opinion, I don't know, suspicious or strange or controversial about the uh, classical ancient or uh, about literature from classical antiquity and how it made its way to the uh, modern west it's a very hard question the the there is the big question i have about the uh, just staying with the latin tradition for a little bit that all of that gets 
process through the Carolingians, basically. They implement a big script reform. And uh, so almost all classical literature is just stuff that they were interested in. So nothing else survives. And so, so what, what they've done is they've, obviously in the Carolingian era, a certain portion of the tradition is selected for survival by, by monks and clerics at the time. And everything else just disappears, right? So that, that process itself is very suspicious. Uh, anyone that doesn't make it through that filter uh, church fathers, uh, classical texts is just gone, right? And there are, you know, it's that, that no one is really, no one really sort of thinks about what that means. Uh, that's 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 one that's one one area that that could be perhaps considered more closely. The the classical literature itself that survives is the Latin it's in is is very distinct from the kind of mm-hmm. Latin that is written in the Carolingian period. It's it's it's. Uh, you know, there's a famous suggestion that uh, when it was discovered that one of the Tacitus manuscripts, you know, the, 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 it's only, it was from Monte Cassino, I believe, uh, was a forgery. Uh, but the, the Tacitus writes in a Latin that 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 is it, it feels it's very hard to describe, but it feels classical. Right. It, it's not no one in the Middle Ages can write in this way. So there is there are linguistic arguments for accepting the the authenticity of of, of classic literature fundamentally. Though of course certain passages seem to have been altered or or removed, this is very common. Uh, there, you know, once you get down into like philological details, there the text is not as stable as you might imagine. Uh, but 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 uh, but yeah, the, the big problem with classical literature, I think, is just how it's filtered, right? And there's an earlier filter as well. Uh, the the Christians after Papyrus sort of goes away, you know, without if you don't continuously copy. Papyrus. If you don't maintain the tradition, uh, it just rots and disappears in in uh, medieval Europe, right? So, so there's this big trans, there's this big shift to parchment manuscripts that happens in between the the sixth and the eighth centuries, let's say, and things that classical texts that aren't copied uh, into parchment manuscripts in that period are also lost. Uh, so there's these two these two big filters: the Carolingians that decide to keep stuff, and the earlier Christians that decide to to uh, maintain the classical tradition. So everything that survives the classical tradition is th- down to a bunch of arbitrary decisions made by, you know, God knows who, a bunch of random monks and clerics, right? Mm-hmm. No, I read a book uh, a couple of years ago about this topic, uh, Scribes and Scholars. Um, oh, yes, of course, yes. Uh, I think it's uh, more or less the standard textbook by Reynolds and Wilson. Um, I, w- what I found interesting uh, is that um, they have this the, the, the role of Ireland, uh, it, oh, yes. it, it, it has always seemed a bit like uh, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it too perfect I don't know like, like that Ireland was like this gigantic rich uh, island where everything is perfect and everyone speaks perfect Latin and Greek and they have all the manuscripts and they uh, make all the theology and uh, they are the smartest people in Europe and they travel throughout of Europe and teach people it's, it's always seemed a bit weird to me uh, just kind of out of place uh, considering that well, yes. considering that Ireland is really a backwater yes and how did the Irish uh, become Christian in the first place right uh, Christianity is a sign of contact with the Roman Empire usually uh, you are you only become Christian because the Romans have uh, incorporated you into their mm-hmm. system that's what the Christians are somehow, uh, and so, so, but somehow the Irish are Christian, even though they were never part of the Roman Empire at all. And uh, and then they invent this weird story about Patrick and and everything yeah. to uh, to sort of explain their conversion, which is entirely legendary. You know, uh, it's 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 very it's very mysterious. And then and then and then Ireland is the is is of course the the I guess the receptacle for a lot of classical learning or something. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's 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 it seems to me an improbable story, right? Uh, the, the in general the role of the role of England in early medieval history is very bizarre. Uh, the it's not just the Irish. The the uh, for me one of the greatest one of the greatest strangest things about about the sort of early medieval Western historical narrative is how the Pope achieves such prominence uh, between late antiquity and and uh, I guess the tenth eleventh centuries. Uh, how it, how he comes to be this sort of central cleric in the West. He's not it's not obvious that, that would happen. He wasn't. He wasn't particularly prominent in the patristic period, and uh, of course, you know the, the the English and Irish scholars and missionaries to the continent are key players in this in this narrative. Uh, it's very bizarre, right? I agree. Yeah, and yeah, um, I think I remember reading in in a, in a textbook that there is like a period of I don't know 150 years where there is no not a single literary source for English history. I think it's like this 
seventh or eighth entry. I'm not uh, quite sure. It, it's between yeah, and, Gildas and be mm-hmm. be the venerable, right? And, yeah. And pretty much at the same time, you have also the Dark Ages in the Eastern Roman Empire, where you also have like uh, the period between the Sassanid War and like the late eighth century, where you also there is not a single written thing from this period except like two laws about farmers or something uh legal documents but not a single actual historical source i find this quite striking this this is a period of 200 years uh, yes no if if, if heribert illich uh knew uh the nature of the tradition and the sources a little bit better he wouldn't have made the atonians the forgers yeah. he would have said the carolingians did it right and he would have moved it earlier because the the it's very believe like the the uh it would much easier to believe that that uh the it's it's the it's primarily the seventh century that's been invented right uh uh the because almost nothing survives from that era it'd be very easy to to sort of come up with a dating system that invents those centuries it's it's much harder when you go later right there's more stuff was uh, seventh century invented or were people in that time just uh i don't know they degraded uh, to some a uh, different form of uh, civilization that didn't have uh, any written sources. So what is the most elegant explanation for that? Well, I, 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 would, I, I think it's, it would be much more interesting to argue that, that a substantial portion of the pre-Carolingian Western history has been, has been altered or invented in some way. That would be the more interesting book, right? And maybe, maybe someone should write that. Uh, the, I think the, the most, the most, the response to that book would always be, of course, that that uh, no, it's just the 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 devolution of material culture and learning after the collapse of of you know the Mediterranean economy and the Western Roman Empire. These are just the longer term consequences. One of the things that happens is is there's this big dislocation, right? Because uh, the Roman Empire maintains all these road networks in in through Gaul and even into 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 Western Germany and Spain. And uh, after the Roman Empire, so cities are planted on these road networks. And after the the Western Roman Empire disappears, the roads aren't maintained, and a lot of cities have to be abandoned, right? Uh, because they, they the roads aren't there anymore. They're just in the middle of nowhere. And there's a big shift to river cities from these road cities. And so so there's this huge civilizational dislocation. Somebody would that's what the argument would be. But right. Eastern Roman Empire stayed uh, cohesive throughout that time. Was the uh, history of Eastern Roman Empire also strange? Yeah, I, I, so, so I'm less of a Byzantinist. I'm not very good at that 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 era. But the I I, I find the the con- I find I guess I find the Eastern uh, the Eastern history less less puzzling with some caveats. Right there is you do have these continuously occupied cities. Uh, you have in many cases to this day, the street plans are still the same. Uh, this, the, there's not this enormous discontinuity that you get in the West. Uh, yeah, so so it, for me, it's it's less of it's less of a problem. Uh, the uh, but 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 of course, uh, not all. There's also a huge blackout in sources in 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 the in the Eastern Roman Empire. You know, they they have their own. Uh, the inv- the Arab invasions, the the end of the war with the Sassanids. There's a very dark period there, also where there's almost no no texts that are contemporary to events. Uh, so the, it's not all perfect, right? So we've mentioned the Arab conquest a couple of times uh, during our uh, episode here, as uh, some people think uh, there a reason for the scarcity of sources, or maybe even a reason for the downfall of the European economy. But uh, a thing that I have recently thought about is that. Um, how Islam, I think, was not as unified as it uh, um, appears in later sources. Um, what I f- found striking was that uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire, basically Islam was regarded as a Christian heresy. In most of the 7th century Byzantine sources we have, uh, Muhammad is just like the Antichrist or a false prophet or heretic. And he's regarded not much different from the iconoclast or whatever uh, flavor of Christian heresy was around at the time. But in the West, you have a completely different uh, outlook on Islam. Uh, I mean, just look at the first page of the Song of Roland, uh, how, they, uh, how they worship <laughs> Apollo and so on. Uh, and they are basically heathens. There are pagans who uh, worship a bunch of weird gods. And uh, I think that's quite strange. And it, it appears to me that uh, maybe the uh, people in 
Spain and the people in uh, Eastern Rome that they had um, what they met were different uh, things and that uh, maybe those were united by political fiat much later than they actually appeared. So uh, this is just a hunch that I have. It's, it's, uh, it's not really an intelligent theory I have, but it's quite strange to me. Also, um, Tyriac tradition in the Quran, I think uh, it was called. It was uh, written by some guy under a pseudonym because he was scared of uh, Muslims going after him, uh, where he uh, makes a philological analysis of the Quran and uh, says that the Quran borrowed a, b oh, a yes. bunch of stuff from Syriac liturgies, uh, Syriac texts, and basically uh, that Islam uh, in its literary form comes not from uh, the Arabian Peninsula or the Ar Arabic tradition, but uh, from an older Syriac tradition. And uh, this was quite interesting to me. I've read that uh, some people disagree with this philology. I mean, I have no idea about Arabic or any of the, or Hebrew or any of the Semitic languages. So I, it's hard for me to penetrate this topic properly. But what I also found interesting is, uh, is a thing that also was mentioned by Galkowski, um, the cult of Ilagabalos, um, which was introduced, uh, yeah, by um, I think uh, that it might have been some kind of precursor to Islam, or maybe even the original form of what became later known as Islam. Because one specific detail that I stumbled upon was that in the original Syriac tradition. Um, in the mythology, uh, Ilagabal is, uh, well, kind of a god, and uh, his wives were Alad and Alusa. And these were like very old uh, Eastern Mediterranean deities uh, that were worshipped by the Arabs and in Syria and so on. And um, even in the 19th century, in like uh, when the Brits uh, came there and wrote some books, Alad was still worshipped as an idol by locals uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. And also both appear in the so-called satanic verses. Uh, you know, the apocryphal hadith that, uh, well, according to Muslim tradition, the devil whispered in Muhammad's ear and told him to write down these satanic verses instead of the actual Quran, which according to Islamic theology has existed, well, for as long as the universe exists. And uh, so it's quite interesting um, because uh, why would these deities from the cult of Ilagabalos, why would Muhammad write them down as deities to be worshipped? Well, though he specifically says in these satanic verses, or oh, he doesn't say all, oh, well, we don't know, it's apocryphal. Or, or he says that uh, Alad and Aluzar are deities whose intercession is to be hoped for. And I find this quite striking. And of course, there's the black obelisk that uh, Ilagabal brought to Rome, which uh, is, well, also appeals very Islamic uh, to my, in my opinion. It's uh, quite strange all to me. Yes, no, I, I saw the, the uh, I am also uh, familiar with these arguments about the, the Quran being a, a, the sort of a, a translation of Christian Syriac texts, I believe is how the argument goes. I'm not in a position to evaluate it, but the, it is, it is very striking that the Quran is, is bizarre in a way. It's, uh, I've only read it in translation, of course, but, but the, it doesn't, it doesn't behave like an ordinary text. It seems confused and muddled. It's, uh, it's 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 very difficult and and uh, so you can see how at least for me that's that's why that might be an intriguing uh, explanation. Uh, the Western attitudes to Islam are very bizarre. Uh, I, I don't I don't know how to explain them at all. The uh, this is true. You know, there's actually a fair amount of contact. Of course, the you know the Visigothic kingdom uh, is is overthrown by the Arab invaders after seven eleven, and you know the the Iberian Peninsula is 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 you know. Uh, a constituent of the the Islamic world. After then, there's a lot of contact. There's, there are native Christian populations in in uh, living under Arab rule in in Spain. Uh, some of them, you know, emerge you know at Charlemagne's court as advisors and so forth. And yet, everyone is everyone is totally ignorant about the nature of of Islamic beliefs, or at least professes to be. That's extremely crazy. There are also constant contacts with Saracens, as the sources call them. You know, in uh, in Italy. 
uh, their their pirates and raiders, uh, the the Byzantines in in Italy and the Pope and and his associates and the Westerners have plenty of contact with them, and they always characterize them as pagans. It's completely crazy. I don't I don't know why. Uh, it's it's very difficult to explain. Uh, you're right that the, the, the early Eastern sources do seem to often portray them as either being in some way Jewish uh, or some sort of Jewish sect, perhaps, or, or, or with Christian overtones. It's very confusing to me. It's been a long time since I've mm-hmm. read this, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very big problem. I don't, I don't know how to yeah, explain it. I actually it. came up with my own crackpot joke theory um, about this, uh, how Islam is derived from the uh, circus factions in Constantinople because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, well, but basically... Are they the Greens or yeah, the Yeah, yeah, the Greens, which, which, the Greens, of course, because... The, the, of course, yes, absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because, well, for <laughs> listeners who don't know, in um, the Eastern Roman Empire, you had these circus factions, which were kind of like organized sports fandoms, like you have today, like fans of specific clubs, uh, and they supposedly acquired the political and religious dimension of the years. Uh some recent scholarship says that this is all bullshit and people just uh, like uh, didn't understand what a sports fan is because they just didn't have professional sports in uh, over the la- vast majority of the last 2000 years so um anyway you had the the blues and the greens and the greens uh, supposedly tended towards monophysitism which was uh, like a heretical um schismatic uh, school of thought that denied the trinity so it's quite close actually in its uh, foundations to islam and since the color of islam is green and uh, byzantine <laughs> <laughs> monophysites were also represented by the the, the green faction uh, i think it would be very funny to make a connection there uh, i think you could probably write a funny book about this no, you should absolutely write it. That'd be fantastic. I know. I, I find it very interesting. You totally. I've never thought about this before. The the the, the congruence between monophysites in the in the East and obviously the Islamic fixation on a single single deity. I'd never 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 hit upon that, but it's very interesting. Uh, obviously, the monophysites seem. This is the theory, at least that I've I've heard, seem amenable to to Arabic rule, right? That's the that's the idea. That's why Egypt falls yeah, so quickly. Yeah. That's isn't that's that is the. the, the Textbooks say this anyway, right? Uh, so, yes. <laughs> How do you think? In what way is uh, academia is heading right now with regards to various historical mysteries, technology, radiocarbon dating, etc.? No, I, absolutely. The tendency is always to, to try to uh, exploit more technological, archaeological, uh, material culture sources uh, to try to be more scientific, right? And and so so dendrochronology is huge. Radiocarbon dating is is a big deal, though. Uh, there, it's never very it's never used in very interesting ways. You know, medieval historians they're not very I don't know I have a very dim view of my field, but they they're not they're they're not the most mentally flexible or imaginative people, and so. You know, you have these like complete morons that are running around like clipping off little pieces of, of manuscripts and like radiocarbon dating them to precisely the year the manuscript says it was copied. You know, I don't I don't really know what we get from that. Uh, uh, but the the absolutely the the there is there is an interest in 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 these these kinds of uh, technical methods. I have to say that personally, I, I I found them at least for for early medieval history. You know, early medieval archaeology since the 1980s has been a huge thing. I find it really uninteresting uh, and unhelpful uh the the it really is true i think you mentioned this in your kalkovsky episode the west uh is just materially very poor in 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 the the early medieval period especially and there's they're not there aren't remains the material remains of anything at all really uh or what you find you can fit into literally any historical narrative you develop right and and so the the a lot of the the stuff of course, it always confirms the written sources. It always confirms the narrative that we have. Uh, but if we had a different narrative, it would be very easy to make it confirm that one too. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm very pessimistic about a lot of that. A lot of that stuff. I haven't seen amazing results there. But it's you know you can apply for grants now. It gives a way to get money. Uh, it's, it's like a whole industry. You can fund grad students with this stuff, uh, even if it's not very interesting. Uh, I recently read something that was quite interesting uh, that might uh, uh, even be applied to your field uh, especially um, they analyzed some of the dead sea scrolls uh, they developed some kind of machine learning algorithm 
to compare handwriting and they uh, confirmed that like two different scrolls were written uh, that had a very similar script and a very similar handwriting and this algorithm supposedly uh, discovered that they were actually not uh, in the same handwriting just a very close one and uh, they basically deduced that this was like a, either a school where they were specifically taught to write like this or it was a family tradition and it was like a son learning from a father or something like this. Uh, this is quite interesting. I think uh, uh, if you can train uh, your machine learning stuff to um, on handwriting, I think that might be quite interesting for medieval sources too. Yes, uh, the of course, you know, the whole field of paleography, which is sort of almost like astrology, right? They, <laughs> these are people that study scripts and then claim that they can date manuscripts based on what the script looks like. You know, this looks like it was copied in Provence between 820 and 835. And, and you know, it's just a fair amount of charlatanry here. Uh, but the, you know, the paleographers are always trying to differentiate between scribes or, or say it's really the same scribe, even though it looks totally different, depending on whatever theory they're, they're, they're trying to support. Uh, it would be very interesting to see if, if, uh, if, if any kind of computer algorithms could could uh, develop objective criteria for this work, it would be very important, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, have you uh, heard about, uh, I think, I don't remember, two years ago, maybe three years ago, when some guy uh, came up uh, with what he believed was an explanation of the famous Voynich manuscript? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The Voynich is solved always every two or three years. It, it, it was extremely <laughs> funny to me because uh, I read his paper actually and uh, uh, it passed peer review for some unfathomable reason. And his uh, claim was basically that uh, it was in some kind of weird um, vulgar Latin script uh, from um, the Eastern Adriatic or something like this. And, and, uh, like it sounds convincing when you read this paper but if you think about it for two seconds uh, it was written like a hundred years after dante they didn't speak this kind of, they spoke this like 800 years before or 900 years before this is this had died out or evolved into italian by that time nobody knew this language basically it, it makes no sense at all and 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 yeah no <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, the Voynich is, I mean, it's obviously some sort of joke, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, the, 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 uh, the, I, I've seen the, uh, uh, I, I've seen some, 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 some studies by information scientists on Voynich that seem to suggest, uh, it's not possible that it contains very much information just by the variation in the characters and, and so forth, uh, that it, it can't really be a language, uh, but the it's it's always solved by every two or three years is a new solution, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the the uh, but it's obviously some sort of alchemical uh, thing that was uh, is drawn up to look mysterious, like it held certain secrets. It was I, I forget this precise history. Mm -hmm. It was it, it was it sold to somebody. It's, yeah, I think I think actually the history of the Voynich manuscript itself, the uh, the material history, is much more interesting than the content. Yes. Because uh, if you look at the the widow of uh, Wilfried Voynich, Isol, uh, born Bull, uh, she was um, very connected uh, to very strange circles. Like she was connected to Russian revolutionaries, to Polish revolutionaries, to English spooks. Like that famous one, Sidney Rayleigh, uh, she knew him personally. And uh, she was uh, in these circles of, of uh, intelligence uh, agents and so on, and international terrorists and whatnot. Uh, I think uh, if you take this uh, into consideration, it becomes much more interesting. It's, you know, it's at the Beinecke Library now at Yale University. Uh, do, do you remember when they acquired it? Was that after the World War, after World War II? Uh, no, it was after World War I. Um, okay, yeah. okay, that's right. Um, I think, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, so, I think officially, um, like, uh, what we certainly know is that around 1930, Ether Voynich ended up with the manuscript. Yeah, and before then, of course, nobody, it's very, very hard to know. Uh, the, the American manuscript libraries, uh, the stuff that they have is, is always of this nature. It's, it's, uh, the Beinecke has a number of these, of these, of these things that fell into their hands, uh, you know, so at some point between World War One and World War Two. Uh, the, uh, very mysterious how they got them, the, the Vinland map is, is the other big famous one that they have, which is possibly a forgery, 
likely perhaps uh and and you know they're all they're all these very mysterious acquisition histories they're clearly stolen by somebody or there's some sort of yeah who knows it's it's very it's very odd yes in conclusion uh, let's create the ultimate historical conspiracy theory by <laughs> hans Unecht, a sitting professor of Romanian University. <laughs> so, uh, I hope you won't get fired. Just pick any weird century from the medieval period and throw it away. Uh, let's count how many weird centuries even were there. So, in what actual century do we live in right now? Is it 19? Is it 18? Yeah, that's a good idea. So, so let's let's get rid of Let's get rid of everything. Let's get rid of the Merovingians. Okay, so so the, so so there everything from Clovis the first to the early sixth century to uh, who is the last one? I forget. It doesn't matter. Somewhere in the mid eighth century, throw them away. Uh, they're fake. They were um, they were invented. Uh, let's say the Carolingians invented them. Uh, everything from that period is is garbage. And so so we're two hundred and fifty years or so. Uh, maybe the early Carolingians too. A few of them aren't real. Uh, so so let's let's throw away about 250 years. That puts us puts us in the, the late 17th century. Like, <laughs> Thanks to you <laughs> and, th and the Romanian Academia, we are now living in the Renaissance. So that's some great news, I think. <laughs> yes, uh, history contains a lot of mysteries and uh, we can go on forever. If you like uh, this episode, you might uh, just uh, comment and maybe we can uh, contact uh, Hans again in some future, if that's okay, of course. Um, it would be a pleasure to come back if this is at all interesting and, and, and all of your listeners are not already asleep or, <laughs> or listening to something else. Now. So yes, uh, thank you for coming and uh, see you next time. Yes, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I found out a lot of new stuff myself and I hope our listeners did too. No, thank you. It's my pleasure.